do is we'll we'll finish this talk. We'll get the panel session underway, and you know a lot of people have got a few uh, kilometres to to drive to get back home and that sort of stuff. So we won't keep you any longer than we need to. Uh, we'll get into Lee's Lee's talk now, and then we'll do the panel session and and we'll wrap it up a bit early. Thank you. about our fishery guys and is that our fishery is getting better and better and in, in most cases our fishery is getting better whether it's tuna, snapper, kingfish, marlin, swordfish, all this sort of stuff. Other fisheries are in decline so South Australia is about to have their shut down for three years. That means no snapper fishing for three years because their fishery has gone so bad. So through correct management, good spawning seasons, things like that, we're able to catch plenty of snapper. Fish like that, that was out of Western Port and that was taken using a different sort of technique because we use a lot of standard sort of techniques here and, and everywhere you fish, they have their set ways of fishing. I fished up the north coast of New South Wales the other week and it was all about fishing really lightly weighted plastics in 45 metres of water for snapper. And fishing up there it was so interesting that most of the snapper we caught were probably in the top 20 metres of the water column. The higher the bite, the bigger the fish. Okay, so there's a few things that... If you think about it, if you look in an aquarium, like the Melbourne Aquarium, you go and watch the snapper and they're swimming around and the big guys are often up on the surface. So they're quite a predator. And Dave and Adam just had those red rockets or the red bait. 
that they get from out off, they get them at Portland, they get them off Lakes Entrance, you get them everywhere, I've caught them up at Bermagui as well. They are a bait fish that moves around a lot and these guys chase them. You know, for years and years it was all about, you know, snapper head down in the bottom eating mussels and scallops and doing that. But they don't have big teeth like that for no reason. Yes, they love to eat hard baits, but they also love to eat bait fish and things. So when it comes to chasing snapper, a range of baits is going to work for you guys. So obviously fresh is always best, but the great thing about the old snapper is that he will eat pretty well anything at the right time. They do like to change their diet just as we do. Uh, but things like your pilchards, your squid, things like that, I call them the steak and three veg. That's just what they eat. Tuna, red bait in this part of the world, that's their steak and three veg. It's just what they eat day in and day out. So you can really fast track your success by just sticking with those key baits. But I think anyone in this room who snapper fishes quite a bit, they'll have their favourite bait that they like to fish in Port Phillip Bay, right, or Western Port or whatever it may be. But for the most part, most of you I would say, and if you don't, I would certainly recommend take a range of baits, okay? Quite often, you might have a 10 fish day on your snapper, okay? Eight of your fish come on pilchards, but the two big ones come on silver whiting. And that's the sort of stuff that can really help. So bait like this is good. Squid, guys, bought, frozen, whatever, is always good. It's always a good bait. It's probably my go-to bait if I had to take one thing anywhere, aside from a block of pillies. Squid is good everywhere, okay? And if you, if you freeze it correctly, it lasts really well. The way I like to do mine is, first of all, don't ever let bait or fish touch fresh water, okay? If it's gonna touch fresh water, you're gonna sit in a bucket of fresh water, you may as well just throw it in the bin. You've, you've pretty well wrecked it. So get your squid. I like to kill them, you know, just sort of, then they're done, they're not as messy, but if you get them, roll them up in glad wrap, and I like to roll them up really, really tight like a newspaper, chuck them in the freezer, they will last for months and months. But moving along, guys, and this is what Belinda asked me to talk about, was a few sounder things. And, and we're really, really lucky. Adam was talking about we're in the golden age of fishing tackle. We're also in the golden age of electronics. I remember when I first moved to Melbourne, I was learning how to catch snapper. You know, guys like Matt Hunt and that. I remember a day we went out and, and you know, you, your sounder was showing like Lego blocks of fish, right? But we got more excited just by marking a bit of bait. You know, we had days up off the south coast and even up off Sydney when I lived there. You would see bait rippling on the surface. You'd drive around it and your sounder wouldn't mark a thing, okay? Now we've got this sort of gear. If I am not marking them, I'm pretty confident they're not there. Not, you know, at times they're, they're, they are not there or they are there, but, but for the most part, guys, our sounders can be that good. I use Simrad gear. People say, why do you use it? And I go, well, if you can use an iPhone, you can use a Simrad. It's that simple. So they're really easy to play with. But this is, guys, this is the, about the perfect sort of description of what you're looking for for a snapper. Now, a couple of tips I can give you. A lot of people ask, oh, what setting should I have my sounder on? What sensitivity? You should be playing with the sensitivity on your sounder or the gain, depending on the model and what they call it. You should be playing with that all the time to get the correct picture. That is really, really important, okay? In Port Phillip Bay, early in the morning in seven metres of water, you're going to have your sensitivity on a completely different setting to what you're going to have it on at lunchtime out in 18 metres. Water temperature changes, water clarity changes, all this sort of stuff. You need to be on the ball with that, guys. The other thing you'll notice is it's always great to have that beautiful, clear screen, but some days to get the best picture where I'm running my game really, really high, and the thing you always want to have on your screen is this clutter stuff here, okay? We're, on my sounder, it shows up blue with that, that background. But you'll even notice, guys, that, that what I've got with the gain set correctly, like even here, that's on auto, but I've pumped it up to six because the water was probably really clear that day. So I needed to get it up to get every little bit of detail in there. But you'll even see, so you've got a fish sitting right on the bottom here, but there's also a fish sitting up there Okay, we're in 15 metres of water. That could be a snapper, it could be anything. So always take note of what you're getting. The other one too with your sounding guys, you know, we're, we're heading to a spot and, and you, you might be heading to a mark on a GPS or you're sounding into a line. If you're heading into the wind or into the tide or into the waves, if you see something, turn around and run with the weather or the tide so that the boat runs even smoother and you'll get an even better picture. Like if I get a scratchy sort of mark, the first thing we'll do is go back over it and check it out again. That there is a couple more snapper. This was um, just the other day. Actually, this was just the other day uh, down at Port Welsh Pool. 
This was some really, really big snapper. We didn't catch them. You'll notice there the water's 14 and a half degrees. So it's still quite cold in that part of the world. But what you've got here, guys, is this is running it on bottom lock as well. So bottom lock really helps you to get a better picture out of your sounder. So on that side there, we're looking from the surface to the bottom. And as the bottom goes up and down and changes and stuff like that, you'll see what it's doing. Bottom lock here, it runs it, it keeps it dead flat. It gives you a really good bird's eye view of what's going on. I've put my zoom on three times and that's why these arches here, th this here is that there. So uh, that there is that there. So what we're getting is a really good view. But what's interesting about this is that's not one fish, that's two fish, okay? Sitting real, like either side by side or, or just you know slightly staggered like that. So you've got a solid return there, but then you've got another solid return here. So this one here with that, that's just where the fish has passed through the beam at a different angle. So in that situation there, guys, the other thing that I'm looking for and always that you're looking for is by having your colour set correctly. On this case here, we've got it at 72. But again, you've got to play around with it and it will change. This is the sort of stuff you're looking for. If you're looking for bottom, you know, especially in Port Phillip Bay, you're not necessarily going to go out and find big reefs and stuff. Yes, there's these funny fridge-looking reefs and stuff like that. But overall, if you can find this sort of stuff here, it can often be a scallop bed or a mussel bed or something like that. So it's stuff that's on the bottom and it's got weed growing off it. And it might only be this high, the weed. But that's the sort of stuff that will congregate the fish. You know, guys will have, I'm sure there's guys here, they'll have spots out in the mud in Port Phillip Bay, 18 metres, no reason, whatever. They keep going back there and they keep catching fish there. And it's probably because they're sitting on a scallop bed or a mussel bed or something like that, which congregates the fish. The other one here, so you've got more fish there. See this here, see how that's a bit of a rougher sort of mark? This is because I was sounding into the tide and the boat was bouncing up and down a bit more. We had tide going that way and wind and stuff and the boat's doing this and that's why that's a bit more of a shaky sort of picture. So, but it's still a strong reading. You can still see that. That bit of red is what you're looking for. So there's lots of other little scratchy bits and pieces and stuff like that. But by having that colour set right and the gain set right, you can clearly see what's going on here. And again, look at that. So that's, there's, there's two snapper there. But this guy here is actually like three and a half metres off the bottom. Okay? So they're more than happy to sit way up in the water column and do their thing. I've even seen snapper feeding up off Wollongong in the cuttlefish run every, every year. They actually get up when the cuttlefish die and they float on the top. The snapper will come up in like 50 and 60 metres of water and start eating the cuttlefish off the surface. So it looks like a trout sipping on a, on a fly. But um, it's really exciting to see. But water depth is actually nothing for snapper, whether it's two metres deep, one metre deep, or 50 metres deep, they will be there. In fact, there's a, there's a spot off Lake's entrance where it's known that big snapper hang out, and it's in 150 metres, 150-something metres, just on the inside edge, or just on the edge of the continental shelf. So they will go where they need to at any time to do their thing. So this here, guys, shows you some more stuff. So you've got a lot of... There was a lot going on that day. I can't totally remember what was going on, but you see I've got the gain running really high here. And even in that, there's not... I've had it really high here. I've obviously backed it off there when I've started to mark some stuff, but I was running it really high here to try and pick up bits and pieces that were going on in this scenario here. So we've got some solid fish sitting here, and then over there, because this is top to bottom, you can see there's more fish sitting there. They're, they're probably more like bait. I would say that could be barracuda or something like that because they're quite small and they're stacked on top of each other like that. They could be slimy mackerel. But this is the sort of stuff that, that can be really helpful, guys. The biggest thing I would ever recommend with any of your sounders or your GPSs is to play around with them. Okay? The only way you'll get the best out of it is to play around with it. It's the same as a computer at home, a television, whatever. The more you press buttons and do stuff, the better you're going to get at it to the point where when you get it right, you can actually, in some cases, tell the species by the way they mark up on your sounder. Um, on, on my unit, I can confidently tell the difference between a marlin and a shark when we're fishing the shelf, just by the way they mark up. The other thing you can actually do is see if fish are active as well, the way some fish mark up. Like if you fish for kingfish, right, and you're getting these beautiful arches and they're, they're like perfect boomerangs and all that sort of stuff, but if I sound along and I mark 500 of them, but then all of a sudden I find this little patch and there's five of them and they're marking up more in streaks, they're active fish. They're fish that are moving around and they're the ones that you will generally catch. 
So that's the sort of stuff you can learn from your sounder. The other one too, guys, is everyone wants to find the absolute mother load of snapper, okay? And it's great when you find that huge pile of them. I think I've got like stuff like this, okay? So there's a heap of fish going on there. It's not a great reading, but there's obviously a lot of fish there. There's fish here. For me, that's not generally as successful. It can be huge, hugely, hugely successful. You can chuck out all the rods and they can go. But overall, this is the sort of stuff I like to see. Two or three scattered fish, okay? And we all have our theories in fishing. But what I like to work on that as, when you look at animals or cattle or sheep in a paddock, when they're all happy and they're feeding, they spread out all across the paddock, okay? And they're all just doing their thing, they're just munching away. When they're not happy, you know, something's not quite right or, or they're just not feeding or they're, they're bedded down, they'll huddle together, okay? And fish, I find, especially the snapper in the bay, for me, they, they can be a lot like that, even out of Flakes entrance. We get them a lot like that. If we fish a place called the Meetung Rocks, it's just a big area of, of rock and shale, you find a cluster of fish and it's so hard not to stop on it, but I've never caught a snapper off these clusters of fish. When you go along and you mark one here and one there and one there, you anchor up and you'll get stuck into them. So that's something to work on. Don't always have to find the mother load. Sometimes one fish, one single fish, can be in an area where there's a whole lot of fish. Because also remember the beam on your sounder is only a certain angle, okay? So in 15 metres of water, you're not actually covering that much, that much water. You know, you pretty well have to drive over a fish, only a couple of metres either side, and you're, you're going to miss him. So just because you mark one doesn't mean there's not more. This is the other one too. So see here, you've got a snapper. All right, there's a couple there, but this is, this is the thing I do love to find. Snapper sitting on bait, okay? And anyone who fishes the bay now and has a boat and a sounder, I'm sure you will agree, there is no shortage of bait, okay? Has that changed the fishery a little bit? Maybe, yes. The fish spend more time looking up they spend a lot of time looking down, but I know that they do spend a lot more time sitting up in the water column. So think in that way, if you're gonna fish with bait, guys, you know, fish one or two rods with no sinkers. Okay, get those baits to float really naturally down and even fish them with an open bail so they just tick line off. Like the last few years, I've had quite good success. Just literally put the rod in the holder, open the bail and just let the bait fall at the back of the boat and it just finds its way down there. And that's deadly successful, especially if you've got a burly trail going. But fish on bait can generally only mean one thing, that they're feeding. It's a pretty sort of simple formula, whether it's, you know, barramundi, snapper, tuna, whatever. So there you go. As I said, another cluster of fish there. You can see, as I was saying, those sort of, um, those more streaky sort of marks rather than the perfect arch sort of marks. Like these, are, they're a bit more sort of that way, and that would indicate potentially fish that are moving around a little bit more. I think these were just sort of small fish. Now, as we move along, guys, um, Dave and Adam were talking about rods and sitting them in your holders and doing all that sort of stuff. Um, you know, it's a very Victorian thing. Every time we go into the state, all the boys are quite, you know, intrigued by our snapper racks when you have them on your boat, and they all freak out that the rod will literally come out of the, the rack, you know. But it's a pretty simple formula. The more down pressure, the more the butt comes up, the more it locks in. So... Um, it's a, it's a great way to fish, and, and the more styles of fishing that you do, especially with bait, the, the more effective it is. I even had a, a trip to Weeper um, a, a, two, a year back, and we were fishing for threadfin salmon, and the, the boys had their rods sticking in the rod holders like that, and the fish were really finicky, and you'd see the rod tip do this, and it'd load, and then the fish would drop the bait, and I'm like, no, no, sit them flat, and I was just sitting my rod on, across the gunnel with my foot on it, and you've got to do it pretty hard, and, and you'd turn that into a hookup, because instead of the rod bending and the fish feeling the, the, the pressure of the rod bend, it's direct line pressure. It's drag that, that as soon as he pulls on it, you jam that hook into him. So it's a super effective way to fish. So if your rods aren't sitting flat, go and get a snapper rack or a set of three ways and you'll be, you'll be far better off. So the other one too is obviously weather conditions. We all have our theories on weather um, and I always find it an interesting one because you, know, you, you never ever know it all in fishing. But obviously dawn and dusk, Great times to fish for nearly every species, I suppose. Um, moon rise and moon set. Who thinks about that when they fish? Does anyone? Yeah? Yeah, I know Mulloway fishermen do. And, and Barramundi fishermen do. Um, but moon rise and moon set can be a big thing in fishing. And next time you catch fish mid-tide when you didn't catch them at the start of a tide or the end of a tide when you thought you would, just take a look through an app on your phone or whatever and check moonrise and moonset. 
and quite often you'll find that that bite that happened, middle of the tide, where you just go, why didn't they bite at the start, on dawn, when they should have? They bit at 9 o'clock. It can often be when there was a moon set. Okay, so it's little things like that that can make the difference. Um, barometer, obviously, that's probably the, the key of what I, I look at, I suppose. And, but it's interesting that for the boat, the barometer is so important, but yet the boys land based fishing, it means absolutely nothing. So does that mean that as anglers, when the barometer is no good and we think we shouldn't go fishing, we should be fishing shallower? Is that what it means? Maybe, maybe. When it's rough, the biggest tip I can give you is fish shallow and, and we all fall for it every single time, you know, we've got beautiful boats these days and it blows its bum off and as much as you know that you should be fishing in shallow, we all still go wide. So, and I say it to a lot of people, I go, when it's been blowing and we had a, a beautiful big blow on the weekend, I say to guys, I reckon if you go out during that blow or the first morning after that blow and you've gone into 10 metres of water, you've gone too far. So, rough weather, Fish shallow at night, fish shallow, maybe low barometer, look to fish really shallow. Those land-based boys are whacking those snapper because it's, it's a pretty good sort of system that does work. So they, catch, they also catch snapper off the beach, guys, um, all through Parkdale and up through Mentone, sort of near, near Morty Alley there. There's a lot of guys that fish, a lot of guys that fish off the pier and the rocks down Mount Martha and Mornington, but fishing land-based along the beach, they have some spectacular fishing at times because all that sand flat that runs through those areas is full of crabs and bass yabbies. And when it gets rough, they all get stirred up. And I mean, these boys, they're casting, I think a big cast, they might be putting their baits into three metres of water, a big cast, an average cast with a 25 knot wind in your face, two metres of water. So, and they're catching plenty of fish up to sort of seven kilos doing that sort of stuff. So it can never be too shallow for these fish. Now, moving along, as I was saying, we all have our ways that we fish for snapper, okay? It's very, very much a bait fishery here, has been since it started for these snapper, and for good reason, it's absolutely deadly effective. But you can make your bait fishing, I believe, even more successful. Um, I'm sure a lot of you know, like the Black Magic Snapper Snatcher and all these other, you know, rigs that are around these days, they're deadly effective. And I know they've really changed it a lot for the charter guys. It's made their lives a lot easier. Rather than trying to fish 12 rods cast out like this, they now fish several rods up and down with that Paternoster style sort of a rig. So these are such a good thing because they allow you to fish a couple more rods. They're such a good thing because if you have your kids in the boat or you have a friend who just has to hold the fishing rod, and drive you crazy, give them one of these things and they can sit there and bob it up and down. This is one of the new snapper snacks from Black Magic, okay? Similar to the snapper snatcher, but a couple of differences. The main reason these guys work is because they're on 80 pound line, okay? And I always like to fish light leaders and do all that sort of crap, but these work because they're on 80 pound line. So see that, see how they sort of sit out more off the, the main line like that? If you do them with 40 or 50, they just hang down and do nothing. This way they sit out a little bit and they bob around. And the thing you're gonna love here, so this, it's got that rubbery sort of skirt and that's actually off one of those Opta jigs that we're all using a few years back. These things, if you put them in the water, the slightest, slightest bit of movement they'll actually just sort of like have this tiny, tiny little bit of movement. So you don't need to bob them up and down like that. In fact, they work when it's really calm. You put them in the holder and they'll just sort of wriggle and do that sort of stuff. That's matched to a circle hook. This is the new KLT and it's got a, it's like a Teflon coating. They call it PTFE. So your hook lasts longer. It doesn't rust up quite as fast. So really handy sort of piece of gear and you fish them straight up and down. When the sinker, the sinker goes on the bottom, right? When this hits the bottom, basically put the rod in the holder and then wind the line so that as the boat goes up and down, that sinker's just touching the bottom. And that alone can help attract the fish because as that sinker hits the bottom, it puts up a puff of sand. It makes a noise, it goes bang. Fish will come in on that. But then the final tip with these that I can give you guys is use a small piece of bait, okay? It's only a little circle hook and this will catch you a 15 kilo snapper, no problem at all if you are lucky enough to hook one. But the idea of this system is you want the fish to come through like this, right? He just comes through. You want him to go, yeah, that looks pretty awesome, that blue and red thing. And just come through, grab the bait and keep going. 
Okay, that way, as soon as he eats that bait, he's done it in one foul swoop, hook goes straight into the corner of the jaw and that rod just loads up. You're fine with a bigger bait. Yes, you'll catch plenty, but he may just sort of put a whole pilly sort of hanging off there. He might just grab the centre of the bait and rip the pilchard off. So personally, I like to put just a, like a pilchard head or a, a chunk of silver whiting or something like that that you're chopping up for burley. So keep that bait small, nice and snack size. And guys, there is every chance, and it does happen quite often, you get the double header of snapper on these, okay? Whether they're little, you know, one kilo fish or five kilo fish, these things are a really, really good part of your fishing arsenal, that's for sure. So the other thing you can do, and probably more so in a current situation, but it does work in Port Phillip, so, so I love to chop up those rigs and put these onto say a western port rig, so fishing in the tide, all right? So on my long leader, I have that sliding up and down my main line, like that, and that just sits on top of a bait, which might be a calamari ring or a squid strip or a, a whatever. And again, it just gives it that little bit of movement, that little bit of flash. It's full of UV, stuff like that. And it's quite amazing how on a slow day, if you catch three snapper, that, and you've got two rods with this out and two rods without it, that this will catch the fish. So it's just all about mixing it up, maximising your options. You know, if your rig got a bit chewed up there, chop this piece off, keep it, and chuck that onto another rig. If you're fishing in Port Phillip Bay with something like this, I do often like to fish that on my Port Phillip Bay rod, guys. And I fish that with just a circle hook, no sinker. Just that on the line, circle hook, and half a pilly, toss that out, and again, as that sinks down, it's got just a little bit of colour and a little bit of movement to it, and it can make the difference for you. So that's all sort of handy stuff. Now, the thing I have here, and uh, this will probably be a debate that goes on to the end of time. Port Phillip Bay, do you fish braid or do you fish mono for bait fishing? I have for <coughs> ever since I have been here, Gone, nah, mono. Fished the braid a few years, had some awesome tangles. Awesome tangles, because I don't know how it does it, but two braid rods can be cast out like that, and in Port Phillip Bay, they'll suck together and then t and do that. <laughs> so, however, I am starting to change a little bit, and it kills me to say it, but my mate Aaron Habgood has been at me and at me, and we fished side by side early season last year, and he's, he's going off his head about his about my mono and I'm going off my head about his braid, okay? Two separate sides of the boat. And unfortunately, he's got a very good point. Early in the season when the fish are being stupid or when the barometer's low, right? And they're being picky and stuff like that. Like, and it happened, he just goes, I had this bite and my, my, even with a, a bait runner on it, just went like zit, and you just saw it go like that. And he just goes, oh, and I'm, then I'm like, yeah, no, nothing, got whatever. And he just goes, you and your bloody stupid mono, and he just goes, watch this. 20 minutes later, his goes like that. And he just goes, whack, and he gets that fish. And he goes, I'm telling you, early season. He goes, when they're stuffing around with the bait, you're hitting them with the mono, and, and you're not getting that direct hook in, right? Whereas with the braid, it's like fishing, you know, when you're lure fishing, there's just no stretch, and he's getting the hook in. Yeah, so it's very, very direct. So, look, the verdict, it, it, there's, there's a part of me that goes, yes, you've got to, probably be a bit versatile, or I'm still a massive mono fan, okay? I absolutely love mono. At the other end of the scale, it'd be interesting to see what Dave and Adam say, I fish a lot of mono in Western Port, okay? Because back in the day when we were all talking about mono versus braid, like I'm talking 20 years ago, okay? Mono was a lot different then to what it is now. 30 pound mono back then was sort of like fencing wire, only thicker. <laughs> now, 30 pound mono, some brands are not far off braid sort of diameter. Okay, and I find it interesting too that if you're fishing 20 pound mono before everyone goes to 30 pound braid, but yet 30 pound braid stronger than, you know, than, than 30 pound mono. So you can actually go down in braid. That's probably a big tip too. If you fish 30 mono before, go to 20 braid. Okay, so I'm fishing a lot of mono and in, in a current situation, mono sits differently to braid. Okay, the braid cuts through the water, but every time the boat moves with, when, when your bait's out and the line's tight, okay, in braid, your bait's doing this. With the mono, it's having this spongy effect and your bait's probably just sort of doing this, if, if anything. So it can make the difference. And I know some of the boys who catch a lot of big gummy sharks, 
They swear by mono over braid. So there's no definites in fishing, guys. Okay, no definites at all. The other one, and I'm actually going to Lakes Entrance in the next few days to go and chase some snapper. Down there, we fish two baits on the bottom, Western Port style, and we fish a floating bait or two. Mono versus braid on a floating bait, mono will outfish the braid five to one. It's quite bizarre, and it's because the braid floats. It makes the bait sink differently, do different sort of stuff. So there's all these variables in fishing, guys. You just need to be really, really versatile. But the greatest thing is that you can mix and match and you can stuff around and do all that. I don't think I've got long left, do I, Dallas? Uh, oh. All righty. So this is probably one of my favourite ways to fish, guys. Fishing for any fish with lures is good fun. Fishing for snapper with plastics is amazing fun. But I'm sure a few years ago, a lot of you would have heard about this guy, Fred Go. He came over from um, Singapore and he introduced a thing called Gamoku. So micro jigging has been around for a, a long time, but none of us ever sort of thought much of it. And then Fred came out with this thing called Gamoku and these white rods and green grips and red grips and it looked more like a toy. But what it did was it, it made all of us take notice of a new style of fishing. So micro jigging is probably one of my favourite ways to fish. It is absolutely huge in WA. And the money the boys spend over there is ridiculous. Like, this, they're buying a little jig like this that's like 50 bucks, stuff like that. It's quite, it's quite scientific, if, well, not scientific, but it's quite technical if you want to get into it that way. So, but for the most part, guys, this is a really good way to fish. So micro jigging is different to jigging for kingfish, and that's probably the first thing you need to get out of your head if you're going to do this sort of stuff. It's really versatile, and it's also really effective if... You know, sometimes you mark fish that are stacked up, but you're not sure if you want to anchor on them or if you see some fish on bait, but it's not enough to, to make you stop. This is where we use this stuff a lot. Okay, we'll just come back, prop the boat, drop the jig down, and usually if the fish are going to eat the jig, you'll send it down, go, eh, yep, got him on. Okay, it's a really, really good way to fish. Even while we're bait fishing, we can jig and stuff like that. But what makes this light jigging or micro jigging different to kingfish jigging is obviously the tackle. You'll see here the rod is really light and I think most of the gamoku rods that got sold in Victoria were ended up using them as squid rods and whiting rods and stuff like that. They're really versatile, you can catch huge fish with them if you take your time. So they're super light, okay, the idea of it is to work the jig. So unlike say kingy fishing where your rod's really stiff and you're trying to rip that jig through the water, with this you want to, you sort of want to lift the, you want to lift the jig so that with this rod, when you lift it, it acts like a, a big sort of rubber band. And as the rod goes like this, it pulls the jig up like that. It doesn't snap the jig up, it pulls it up. So that way the jig will wobble on its way up. And then depending what jig it is, but in most cases, all your micro jigs have a V-shaped side to them. So it's like the, the hull of a boat, basically. So when it sinks, it goes like that through the water and it flutters and shuffles. Some of them zigzag and do this. This one here just goes, looks like a dying bait fish. So they're really, really quite effective ways to fish. You get your stuff down quickly, you can easily keep it in the fish's face, all that sort of stuff. You can know where you are by multicoloured braid. But most of all, the really interesting thing with this was when I first started doing it, we we're hooking these fish, we we're hooking these snapper and giving them heaps, we're just getting stuck right into them, and, you know, because it's jigging gear, so you pull as hard as you want. So, and we just kept losing fish, like some solid fish too. Couldn't work it out. But then when you took a step back, and looked at what you're putting into those fish, right? You're putting in these tiny little assist hooks, okay? And the other thing that we noticed that was happening too was that the bites, quite often, you'd, you'd lift the rod up and as it's going down, your bites on your rod would go like this, they'd go like that. And you're like, what? And you sort of just start winding and the rod starts bending and then you're hooked up to this fish that's just shaking its head. So what it seems happens is when you catch your snapper or your reef fish or whatever it may be, in most cases, the hooks are all around the outside of their face. It's not too often that they've cake hold it, right? So you're just in the lips and stuff like that. So once we took a step back and looked how ridiculous we were being, we started backing the drag off, fighting the fish like a normal person, okay? Because they're not going to bust us off in the mud. Then started landing these fish. And as I said, in most cases, they're all just hooked in the face. And, and it's really interesting that they do seem to just nibble away at the assist hooks. 
and some of the biggest reef fish I've caught, red emperor and big finger marks and stuff up in Queensland, same thing, they just go tap, 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 tap. It's quite bizarre. So it's a really great way to fish. It's a deadly way to fish in Western Port. Okay, we catch a lot of snapper on this in Western Port. And the best thing about this is we can fish in the shipping channel. But you didn't hear that from me because you're not anchoring. So we're using, so, so as anglers, we're, we're sitting out of the shipping channel and anchoring, aren't we? Right? If we're behaving, we're sitting outside, right? And then we're waiting for the fish to come to us, okay? And you might have that, you might catch them all tied, but you might have that flurry of 10 minutes or whatever where you catch a couple and then they're gone. I can tell you now, last season, I followed a patch of fish from Stony Point to pretty well the quail bank in one tide. You just this school of snapper that were running their way up the middle of the channel. And you just go up and you find them and you drop your jigs on them and you got a bite or you didn't and then you go back up and you'd find them again. And they were moving quite quickly. So that was one patch of fish moving with the tide. If you were anchored, your fish come and your fish go. All right? This way, we're moving with them. If that patch of fish doesn't want to feed, don't worry about them. Go to the next patch of fish. If they're small fish, go to the next patch of fish. They might be big fish. So what we're doing is being a bit more active, guys. So that's where all this sort of stuff can be. Stacks and stacks of fun. And it just sort of opens up your options. Um, I use this for trout trolling. I use it for squid fishing, whiting fishing. Kids beat each other to death with them, stuff like that. So there's heaps of stuff you can do with it. These boys have got really cool range of this sort of stuff. You can use this stuff off, say, Mornington Pier, jigging around the pylons with little jigs. You catch all sorts of funky stuff. So well worth looking at to do something different for your fishing. So I think we're pretty well... Running out of time, Dallas, or Dallas is asleep? Yeah. Most people are asleep, so yeah. Sorry, on that jigging rod that you've just got there, that's braid or is that? That's braid with that, yes. And you do want the braid for that scenario, so. Yeah.